So again, that was the first witness called by the prosecution. This afternoon, I'm very fortunate to have two different guests with me. Judge Birmingham joining us from Dallas, Texas. Thank you for being with us. And good I, afternoon. It's good to be here. Thank you. And I also have Ross Kramer, a criminal defense attorney in New York. So I'd like to start with you, Judge Birmingham, in this particular case. Tell us about um, why do you think the defense is presenting evidence about the actual shooting by Van Dyke and whether or not he used reasonable force? What does that have to do with the allegation that these three covered up that crime? Well, it's probably going to go to show uh, that the officers, when they were making the statements and writing the reports, um, were accurate in what they were saying. In other words, that uh, by presenting what was happening, what actually happened during the shooting, uh, if what the officers have put in their reports is consistent with, or even at least arguably consistent with, uh, what they can show happened during the circumstances of the crime, well, then they weren't being untruthful in what they were saying in those reports. All right, let me ask you, Ross, and one of the questions as a defense attorney, how often do you see, if you do police reports, where the perception of the officer who completed the report, what's in the report, is very different than a video or what another officer says they saw? Well, you do see that. But in this case, it's kind of a unique situation because all of this was litigated already. This was litigated in the first Van Dyke trial, and what Van Dyke says he saw that uh, this victim lifted the knife or appeared to be putting the officers in danger, a jury unanimously found that that was not credible testimony. So I don't completely understand why they're trying to relitigate that again here towards a judge. Twelve, you know, twelve individuals watched that video, the country watched that video, and it just didn't come out the way that the defense attorneys here or Van Dyke's attorneys were trying to spin it. So I'm not really sure the point of going from scratch with that argument again. All right. So we're going to have a lot of great discussions. Stay with us after this short break. So this witness is getting into evidence 12 different reports. And the prosecution's theory is these reports falsified what happened to cover up a crime committed by Van Dyke. So let me ask you first, Ross, is, okay, you heard the testimony, and I'm looking at my notes, that the three defendants, the three officers, are referred to as the victims in this case. The offender is Laquan McDonald, who was then later shot. Is that in and of itself enough to say these were falsified documents? Well, it goes, it goes a certain uh, distance because the judge in this case is the bench trial will be able to see that through witness testimony and the video that these three, the two officers and the detective were not actually victims in this case. They were not injured by, by the person who was ultimately killed by Van Dyke. Um, also, what's interesting is that those three statements were all coordinated. Those all appear to be you know, use similar language, and I think that's the point of what is being shown here, that uh, the prosecution may not be able to show that three co-conspirators sat in the same room and talked, but the other evidence of coordination is there, you know, three similar accounts that are all untrue in the same way. And Judge Birmingham, let me ask you, would you make anything of that testimony that in the reports the uh, McDonald was holding what he referred to in the reports as a knife or a cut instrument. Would that does that mean anything to you if you were the judge hearing the case? Uh, I do think it's important to uh, to compare what the words are versus what the evidence is in the case. And I I think that if they're they're writing a certain description, um, that is that the uh, Mr. McDonald had a weapon in his in his in his possession. Uh, and that statement's going to have to be measured against uh, what the actual evidence was. And, and I do think it's an excellent point by Mr. Kramer that the, the conspiracy can be inferred from the consequences, of, or I'm sorry, from the actions of the conspirators. And certainly in a case where you're alleging they conspired to cover up, if they're using the same language, that is evidence that they had agreed because it's, it would be a, a very big coincidence they happen to describe uh, this conduct in the same way using the same or similar language. I love this discussion. It's so fun to hear about the different perspectives. And this is really a pretty convoluted trial in terms of three defendants. They each have a different defense that they are arguing, different perspectives on what happened, what didn't happen. So we are now going to hear testimony. This was the prosecution's fourth witness. And this is um, Officer McGilligott. And he is actually the partner at the time of Gaffney, who's one of these three defendants. 
So I do want to make one correction. That was, in fact, Officer McGillicott, and he was testifying about what he witnessed. But that was when he testified in the Van Dyke trial, which law and crime covered gavel to gavel some time ago. And so that was the testimony from that particular case. Judge Birmingham, I would like to ask you, how many times have you seen, if ever, officers have to testify against other fellow officers in your court? I mean, it's, it's only happened on very few occasions. Uh, there's really only one or two that come to my mind um, where that's happened. And how do you think they did? I just think looking at this witness as he testifies, to me he seems very visibly uncomfortable, and I would assume that it would be uncomfortable to have to testify against fellow officers. What's your opinion of that? Yeah, I, I certainly think that there is a measure of, of brotherhood, uh, camaraderie, um, you know, and, and, and honestly, the police officers that are out there on the street, uh, the partners, they, they're out there on the street. They're literally putting their lives in the hands of each other. Uh, and so and, and, and they probably the witnesses appreciate and understand the gravity of their testimony as well. They know what they're saying is going to be impactful in a certain way on a particular case. And if that's a negative impact on, on one of their brothers, well, that's got to hurt to deliver, I'm sure. And so, Ross, let me ask you this. How many times do you see, as a person has to testify more than once, their testimony changes? So he testified in Van Dyke. Now he has to testify in this um, <coughs> trial against these three defendants. Is his testimony likely to be exactly the same? Well, no, it's never likely to be exactly the same, and that's, that's a great benefit for whoever's going to be cross-examining him. He made statements preparing for his first testimony, made statements preparing for his second testimony, now he's testified twice. So any little changes in his testimony can be exploited by a cross-examiner. But I thought it was really interesting, going back to your first point, to watch all of these uh, officers testify in that first trial and testify credibly. I thought just as a, as a criminal defense lawyer and as a citizen watching it, watching all of these other uh, officers who acted responsibly during the whole situation get up on the stand and testify that one of their fellow officers didn't act responsibly and didn't follow procedures, I thought was, was a very heartening thing to watch during the first trial. Well, stay tuned. We're going to continue to analyze this trial, and we'll be back after this very short break. So that was eyewitness Xavier Torres testifying in the trial against Van Dyke. Now, we understand that he will not be testifying in the current trial against the three law enforcement officers charged with conspiracy and cover-up. The prosecution at this point in this current trial has introduced six witnesses. We understand they have one more witness, and that's not going to be Xavier. So let me ask Ross Kramer, criminal defense attorney, here with us today, what is the reason, if you know, that they might not call all the same witnesses witnesses in this case where it's a bench trial versus a jury trial? Well, I think you have a different strategy in a bench trial. I don't think you need quite as much background. You don't need quite as much cumulative evidence because your finder of fact here is a sophisticated judge who's, sat, who's sitting on the bench and is understanding what's going on, maybe without all the preamble that a jury might need to get them up to speed. I think the choice to have a uh, a bench trial here instead of a jury trial is a really interesting choice in the first place. As a criminal defense attorney, I think there are very few situations when you would choose to have a bench trial. And, you know, those limited situations are when something is so complex that a jury might not understand it, where the facts in a case are so complicated, or where uh, you're dealing with a certain issue that you don't think in a certain jurisdiction you can get a fair and unbiased jury pool. And, and here in Chicago at this time, they might have felt that way with regard to an officer shooting. So let me ask you, Judge Birmingham, as a judge and a sophisticated judge that's joining us today to give your commentary, how, do you, how would you describe for the viewers the difference from your perspective between a bench trial where you have to make the decision versus a jury trial? Uh, bench trials tend to be um, uh, shorter. Uh, I think the lawyers will get together and sort of agree of what's admissible, what's not. Uh, I do think that it's uh, easier for the lawyers to narrow it down to those issues that Mr. Kramer was talking about, whatever the, the very particular issues are in the case, to narrow it down uh, and present that to the judge. Um, I think that if you're going to uh, go to the judge, it's usually because there is a very specific 
outcome that you're looking for, whether it's a not guilty or maybe it's, you know, in a lawyer's opinion, they do think that there's going to be a conviction. So they're looking for a certain outcome on punishment. And you feel like, um, you know, that you're more likely to get whatever that outcome is from the from the judge. And that's why you might pull the trigger on that. All right. Thank you. We're going to go now and listen to testimony from Jose Torres. And this was another eyewitness. It's Xavier's father. They were in the car together. Jose was taking Xavier to the hospital. When they came upon the police activity, they were stopped and they witnessed the shooting. And this is testimony um, from the trial that we're going to replay now. Talk about compelling testimony. So this eyewitness specifically says, I saw him fall to the ground and then there were more shots. The shots kept coming. What kind of compelling testimony? If you heard this, Ross Kramer, what would you think? Well, we, we heard this kind of thing from the first Van Dyke trial, and I thought it was a very compelling testimony, and I was not surprised at all that there was a, a quick conviction in that case. Um, you know, I think this kind of testimony combined with a video, an officer's body cam that we, you wouldn't have had a generation ago when you were having these trials, really brought to life what happened here and how unreasonable it was for this one officer to make the decision to start firing and to keep firing while a whole bevy of other officers were there, you know, trying to contain the situation and made the judgment that there wasn't an imminent danger to either officers or anyone else in the vicinity. And so part of the reason that he's testifying is because because he heard what happened is a couple days later, a day later, he heard on TV there was a news report. And at that news report, the police representative said, oh, the defendant on the ground, the offender who they were calling him at that time, but the one who was shot and killed, Laquan McDonald, was actually lunging or moving to attack the officer. And so that was part of the reason he said he came forward, because he said, that's wrong, that's a lie. Judge Birmingham, how compelling do you think his testimony is? in this case against these three law enforcement officers? It is a very unique uh, perspective that is uh, removed from this police brotherhood that you and I and Mr. Kramer were talking about just a, a few moments ago. You know, this is an, uh, ostensibly, uh, if you believe what he's saying, an independent eyewitness who is not going to write a police report. He's not, uh, doesn't know the officers apparently, he doesn't know anything. He's just saying what he saw. And it's kind of like the next best thing to a, a, a the a, the body cams that we were talking about. Um, you know, you've got an independent eyewitness who's laying things out, and the, the 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 level to which the police officer's statements are going to be different than what this independent witness is saying is something the judge is going to be considering to determine whether the officers were in fact lying or mistaken. It's going to be really interesting to see the conclusion of this trial and what this judge decides. I will say, based on what we've seen in the trial, the judge is very engaged. She's taking notes. She's ruling on objections. So I think it's going to be a lot of fun to see what other evidence comes out. Stay with us. We're going to continue to analyze this trial on law and crime after this very short break. Judge Birmingham, watching that clip, did you find that the, the witness was getting defensive at all when questioned as cross-examination? Uh, maybe a little bit. I, I thought that, you know, the uh, the witness was doing the best he could. I, you know, police spokesman, union member, uh, you know, I guess that's just one way to, to cross-examine his testimony. Uh, but I think the the uh, the witness came across pretty well and not fighting him too hard, uh, sticking to what he said as opposed to his knowledge of the titles and everything like that. So this is the fourth time that this individual's had to testify. So remember, he was an eyewitness. He's not law enforcement. He wasn't related to the case. He was in a car. He saw the shooting. He testified at grand jury. He testified for the internal investigation. He testified at Van Dyke's trial, and now he's testifying again. Ross, what does this do to people who are watching who think, well, gosh, if I report a crime or report something I see that's not right, I have to go through all this? Are you kidding me? <laughs> well, you know, sometimes this is really what, what has to happen when you report a crime and you get in the middle of something like this. I, I agree with the judge. I think the witness is doing well here. And I also think that, um, you know, these little discrepancies with his testimony and small inconsistencies and things he might have gotten wrong might be more impressive if there was a jury watching this who may not understand that these are smaller issues. I don't think this is impressing a judge at all. And I don't think that this lawyer is making a lot of, uh, a lot of forward progress with a cross-examination like this on small points in front of a judge who understands what the big issues are and is going to be focused on the right things. All right. So certainly I would say that this individual did the absolute
absolute right thing coming forward. And if he saw something that he believed wasn't right or was reported differently, a crime was committed, he did do the right thing. Let's go back and watch a little more of this cross-examination and see if it changes any in terms of the demeanor and tone. So that was one of the other defense attorneys cross-examining that witness. There are three defendants in this one trial. They each have an attorney, so each of those attorneys has the opportunity to cross-examine the witness. This is an eyewitness. He saw what he saw. He's testified before. He's testifying again. Judge Birmingham, why would the state have all three defendants together in one trial versus three trials, if you have an opinion on that? And then the second question I would have is, um, does that affect a witness his comfort or ability to sound credible when he's got this many different attorneys asking questions? Well, the, the first one is I'm sure Illinois is probably uh, similar. If, if The presumption is the trials uh, of co-defendants will be tried together unless there's a reason not to. Um, I think especially in a case where you're trying to prove a conspiracy, an agreement to commit a certain crime, uh, you know, obviously it's easier uh, if you're the prosecutor to have everybody in the same room. Um, as far as being a witness, I have had to testify before. I don't know if you all have, but it is not fun. And I've tried a lot of cases before. It's just, even with that experience, it's not easy to do that. Uh, it's hard to be cross-examined by one lawyer. I would imagine it would be three times as hard to be cross-examined by three lawyers. And what do you do if they're theatrics? If you have a bench trial and you have defense attorneys or prosecutors who are engaged in a lot of theatrics, do you tend to let it go or do you rein it in and say, let's not do all that? As long as it's focused on the issues that we're really squarely trying to decide, I don't have any problem with it, um, you know, it, it, within reason, of course. But, but really, that's the, the idea behind the, the, the bench trial is a streamlined pursuit of the truth in that particular case. And so the theatrics, as long as they're on the relevant issues, then bring them on, because I do think it's entertaining. Uh, it's probably dulled down a little bit than it would be in front of a jury, and I would expect it to be a little more dulled down than it would be in front of a jury. But, you know, I also want to make sure the lawyers are going to try their case. Ross, just really quickly, do you use theatrics as a defense attorney when it's part of the strategy of your case or not? Well, absolutely. I think that juries have a certain uh, expectation for what lawyers are going to be like and what how lawyers are going to vigorously defend their client. I think it really is different in front of a judge, though, who's a little too sophisticated for fall, to fall for some of those theatrics. All right. So please stay tuned. Fascinating discussion about this case and the cop cover trial up. We'll be back after this break. So again, this is the interrogation video that's been released today, the interview of Chris Watts after he was arrested. Now, it is hard to hear. I neglected to tell you that before we went into the clip. It is a little hard to hear. That's the quality of the video. So I'm here to break it down with our special guest. So let me start with Ross Kramer, who's a criminal defense attorney. Police interrogation, is this the first step after an individual's been arrested for a crime? Well, police try it as a first step. Uh, as a criminal defense attorney, I wish that more people understood that they have no obligation to answer questions, that they have no obligation to talk to police officers and defend themselves, that it's the prosecutor's job someday to try to prove that they committed any sort of crime, and that they're not going to talk police out of whatever notions they may have at that time of the interrogation. You know, there should, there should be some sort of remedial high school class that tells people what your constitutional rights are, and that you have an absolute right to refuse to talk to police under those circumstances, but a lot of people do go and sit down and have those conversations and try to talk their way out of it. Very often, there's not a good result from that. All right. So we are going to continue listening to that interrogation. And remember, when he was first questioned, the response was he hadn't done anything. So let's see what happens. So you see the law enforcement officer, she says to him, listen, you have not shed one tear in the couple of days that you've been here. I just absolutely don't get that. So let me ask you, Judge Birmingham, in your opinion, how much does the demeanor of the defendant tell us? Or does it mean they did it, they didn't do it? What's your experience? I think that the demeanor is absolutely critical because it's easy to control your words and you can play the word game 
Uh, and I've seen it uh, over and over in interrogations in all my time as a prosecutor and, and now as a judge. But the one thing you can't change is your demeanor. It's really hard to control that throughout the time. And if you watch that interview, uh, what happens, the thing that really changes the dynamics in that interrogation room is when she points out something that cannot be disputed. I mean, he knows that they don't know where the bodies are. But he also knows that it is a fact that he has not cried or broken down emotionally in their presence, and he can't argue his way around that. And the dynamics have completely changed uh, in that interrogation room based on his demeanor. All right, Ross, do you agree with the judge? Do you have any different opinion about the demeanor of the defendant in this particular case? No, I agree. I mean, his, he, he was so bizarre in the way that he handled his interactions with the press, interactions here with the with the uh, prosecutors. And remember, he's not a defendant at that point. He was just someone that they were talking to and looking at. They may have had their suspicions, but he wasn't, he wasn't charged at the time with anything. And he couldn't even muster a basic humanity in the way he was having these uh, conversations that I thought um, really helped the police to focus in on him as a primary suspect. All right. You will not want to miss what we bring you. We are going to be showing you the television interview that he gave, that Chris Watts gave, and we can compare that with the demeanor that he had in his interrogation. We'll be back. Please join us after this short break. Welcome back to Law and Crime. We all love covering this trials. Unfortunately, I'm going to have to say goodbye to guest Judge Birmingham. You have been fabulous in giving us your expert analysis. But let me have you quickly tell us about a podcast that you do that I'm excited to share with our viewers, and it's Murderous Design. What is it about? Uh, we, we take a look at some of the historical trials with North Texas ties. Uh, the one we're doing right now is Charlie Manson's right-hand man, Charles Tex Watson. We go through the killings of the Tate Lee LaBianca murders. And the next one I'm going to do is Dallas' serial killer named Charles Albright. Uh, he was an eyeball killer. And that's what he's known as. He would um, t kill prostitutes and take out their eyeballs in a very bizarre uh, manner of death. And so it's just looking at how the police solved that and how the prosecutors tried the case from the crime scene all the way to the courtroom. Wow. Fascinating stuff. I know that people would like to tune into that. Thank you again for joining us. We look forward to having you another time. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. Thank you. We're going to return now to the interrogation. Now, keep in mind, an interrogation video, it's recorded at the time of the video, and the video is is what it is. It's as we got it. So we recognize it may be a little bit hard to hear. The lips and the sound may not look like they go exactly together, but some really interesting information. We're going to see what happens when Chris Watts asks to talk to his father during this interrogation. Let's listen. <laughs> 